have to tell you, I do have a okay. firearm okay. on me. Don't reach for it, then. Don't pull it out. Don't pull it out. In light of the recent acquittal of Euronimo Yanez, the police officer who fatally shot Philando Castile, and video that has surfaced that is really heartrending for uh, most Americans to see, I'm talking to Joseph Williams, who is a staff reporter for U.S. News, who recently wrote an article to try to explain some of the underlying legal precedent that seems to always override what many of us feel are um, videos that are incontrovertible. There are a couple of Supreme Court precedents. One is Tennessee versus Garner, a case in which a police officer shot a man during an arrest and the other is a case out of Ohio in which a diabetic man had gone into a convenience store to try to get some insulin. The cops thought he was suspicious. They arrested him. He sued the department. He lost. The case went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in both cases said that a reasonable standard is the one that had to be met. In other words, if we think that an officer has reasonably fear of his life, we sat on the side of the officer. And since it's been upheld for almost 30 years, almost no one has challenged it in any significant way because the Supreme Court basically has spoken and because law enforcement has the general support of not only the federal lawmakers, but lawmakers on a state level. Nobody wants to criticize the police. Nobody wants to have someone criticize them for putting police officers in harm's way. So are you saying that race is not an issue? when juries are instructed and when juries deliberate on these cases? Well, as far as I know, race has never been challenged as an issue in a police uh, use of force case. It's always been the same old standard. I feared for my life and the law is on my side. And that by and large is why you've not seen any convictions in any meaningful convictions of police use of force in, in decades. Um, and as a matter of fact, the Walter Scott case was probably about the closest as we've gotten. Walter Scott had some priors and was fleeing, in fact, so the officer shot him as he was running away. Again, the, the, the defense there was imminent fear. I felt like I was in danger. I felt like he was a danger to myself and the public. Therefore, the jury couldn't reach a substantial verdict. I thought the first case that you mentioned said that if someone's running away, that you can't say you were afraid for your life. It did, but that doesn't keep officers from saying, I still feared for my life, and juries looking at the totality of the circumstances and agreeing with them. Okay, so they know what they have to say, and this is where I think race does come in. It's, I feel as if in this country, the ruling class whites have conducted psychological warfare against working class whites to make them unreasonably afraid of African Americans. So when I watch the Philando Castile video, I just don't understand why the man panicked so quickly and fired his gun within seven seconds. The only explanation that I, especially because it happens over and over again, is that he was more afraid of this man because of his race than he would have been if it were me. So is there a way that either in training or in law or can this Supreme Court help us? Well, there have been study after study, scientific studies, to prove that implicit bias does exist society-wide, and police officers are no different. Um, implicit bias that they fear a dark-skinned person more than they fear a white-skinned person, and that's been the key there. I mean, those uh, implicit biases have not necessarily come up in jury cases, but they have come up in lawsuits. The problem is that police departments aren't as progressive as they need to be in identifying implicit bias, training officers to be aware of it because you're never going to get rid of it, and having that training go a step further into dangerous situations on the field. So it is coming to, 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 to play and to a wider consciousness among law enforcement officials that this is a thing. But you also have to understand that right now we're in an era of Donald Trump, law and order, protect the police. There are several states that have passed what they call uh, a police officer's bill of rights. Yeah. And a lot of them kind of build on what society already feels about police is that they're in a noble profession, they can do no wrong, and that what they are doing is a dangerous job, which it is, I mean, mind you, we have to accept that. But the dangerous job also comes with a certain amount of non-culpability. They haven't been culp held culpable, not even for shooting African Americans, but for shooting people in cars, for shooting people on the street. So people are aware of it, but there hasn't been any kind of meaningful, substantive change that's allowed this to, to bubble up through the population hit the Congress here, the Supreme Court there, and be recognized as a very real danger to a certain segment of the population. 
you know, um, Alonzo Baden, who's part of the TYT family, he said recently, make him go to college. One of the things that happens when you go to college is you're exposed to a lot of different right. people. Mm -hmm. So speaking to your point of, of dealing with other communities, just that experience opens your mind to there are other people. That's a very uh, powerful suggestion because a lot of people, even African Americans, don't necessarily know the long history of, of people and conflicts of uh, between uh, African Americans and the police departments in this nation. It's long, it's, it's fairly consistent, but a lot of people in the general public don't know, hence a lot of jury decisions. Yeah. Training police officers and having a better educated police force is one strong step. It used to be a civil service job that you didn't need anything beyond a high school uh, diploma for, but now it's gradually becoming more and more accepted that police officers have to go at least to community college, have to accept some kind of postgraduate education. In the second half of the article, you talked about how even though these cases have resulted in acquittals or hung juries, the activism and the public attention has resulted in some things that have made us more safe and prevented the police killings that we never heard about because they didn't happen. That's right. Uh, one of the things is, is body cameras. They're not a panacea, but they certainly do provide more evidence than just anecdotal, and it, it, it takes it beyond the cop's word against the victims, because in a lot of these cases, the victims aren't even around to tell their side of the story, and that's another factor in a lot of these acquittals. But uh, body cameras, uh, dash cams have been very effective in at least bringing this stuff to light, as well as uh, citizen cameras. There are a couple of uh, ACLU projects out there that teach citizens how to record uh, police interactions that they might pass by on the street. Not only do they tell you how to record it, they also tell you how to upload it to the ACLU, how to get them involved. It comes with a template about filing a complaint about a police officer. So along with institutional reforms, which has been going very, very slowly, you have uh, cultural and populist, you know, populist reforms that are probably going to have much more of an impact because the institutional change is going to take place so slowly. Right, and so like some of the federal investigations, and even though they didn't, for, for instance, uh, Michael Brown find uh, reason to, to... They didn't find reasons to indict the officer. Right. However, getting the Justice Department involved right. opened up a whole new uh, problem for the f citizens of Ferguson, ones that the black people on the black side of town kind of understood. Basically, that is the institutional bias, not only in the police department, but also in the court system, in the bail bond system, the way the town functioned in general. You had uh, citizens going to jail because they were too poor to pay a fine. You had citizens going to jail because they had missed a date on a traffic ticket. You had people who lost livelihoods, homes, families, had to be incarcerated because of a civil crime. That's also been on the national progressive radar when it comes to policing in America and how to get beyond the institutional bias that we're now seeing. Getting the feds involved will not necessarily result in charges. As a matter of fact, the standard is very, very high yeah. for the Justice Department to get involved in a police-involved shooting. Even though people often call for a federal investigation, it doesn't result in charges. It results in, in no charges more often than not. But it does bring a federal eye to some of these law enforcement departments, to some of these practices. Black Lives Matter, uh, don't underestimate the impact that it has had on causing police to think about how they do their job and maybe involve some retrospect. But along with that, there have been million dollar civil judgments. Uh, Eric Brown's uh, family got a middle, million dollar civil judgment in the-, the Eric Gardner? Uh, Eric Gardner, I beg your pardon, Eric Gardner. That hits police where it hurts most in the budget because m money is <laughs> money is kind of finite and, and budgets aren't getting larger except for more militarization. Heather Jenkins wants to know, how can a jury find a police officer not guilty, but then the families and victims are awarded money for being killed? That's confusing. Well, that's because the civil judgments, the, the burden of proof is a lot lower than it is in a criminal court. In a criminal court, you have to have beyond a shadow of a doubt. In civil court, it's beyond all reasonable doubt. It's beyond a, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So uh, they are awarded huge penalties because it's easier to convince a jury in civil court than it is in criminal court. Lindsay Norton says police training in the U.S kill or be killed, generate as much revenue as possible, go after people who probably can't afford a private attorney. How productive or how unproductive do you feel it is to paint with a broad brush the entire profession? It's not productive uh, in that it impugns the, the, the thousands of really good qualified officers who do their job well and who end up not shooting somebody to death. Uh, that being said, the, the constant uh, parade of, of officers going in and out of the court without being convicted, it does have a lot of people frustrated enough to paint with a broad brush. To this day, you only have a handful of progressive departments who are actually saying, yes, we get it, we understand this is a huge problem. 
uh, more often you have departments that will go back and, and circle the wagons and lean on their own uh, code of conduct and say, well, we have it here in our rules. He followed the rules. You know, the shooting was good for us. Uh, take, for example, the case in New York of, of Eric Garner. The chokehold that was used uh, to suffocate him was illegal yeah. by the department's own standards. However, the department standards and actual criminal law are two different things. So while, he, while the officers who, who, who killed him may have violated their own department standards, they would get nothing more than, say, uh, a reprimand. You might get suspended without pay. You might be relieved of your duty. That's not the same thing as a Supreme Court judgment that will say, okay, you no longer can do these things. And because the standard is so elastic, you don't really have substantive ground level reforms taking place. Hence, the broad bro strokes, the broad bro brush. <laughs> Thank you very much. The broad brush strokes that you have people uh, uh, asserting certain conduct to police. Uh, moreover, if you look at all the European communities, they have far less police involved shootings than we do. Yes. They have far less guns than we do, which is another factor for another discussion for another day. Yeah. But certainly that plays into it. So it's very easy to look broadly, especially because you don't have people in the department stepping up saying, yes, you're right, we do have a problem. You don't have that on a wide scale. You don't have law reforms, and you don't have Congress or local lawmakers doing something about it. Derek Lawson says, it seems like we treat cops like we treat soldiers during wartime. Regardless of what they're doing, they're fighting a war, quote unquote, so ultimately they can do no wrong. It's a dangerous place to be. It is a dangerous place to be because, we, in, in, to stretch the analogy a little bit further, we also have a militarization of the police departments uh, across the nation. You, you saw it uh, in 2014 in Ferguson where officers had sniper rifles, they have armored personnel carriers, they have bazookas in one case. So there is a very, strict, a very uh, blurring of the lines between officers on the beat and the, co and, and the soldiers who go out and, and, and defend the nation in time of war. So it's easy for people to get those lines blurred and it is a very dangerous situation because if you do hold the cops in such esteem, then you are less likely to hold them responsible for bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what we've seen in a lot of these verdicts that have come down in the last several weeks.